United Methodist Church. And one of the things I was visiting with Tyler about is I was also a history major in college. And, um, and really, history has always been my first love. Um, I went to a small college, uh, Nebraska Wesleyan University, about the size of Carroll. And when I went to Nebraska Wesleyan, one of the things that I had a real benefit of is our history department. Even though it was small, every single professor in there had a connection with religion. The chair of the department, his wife, was a Lutheran pastor. Uh, another, pa another professor uh, studied early modern Europe, and the only reason he studied early modern Europe is because he was Lutheran, and he wanted to learn more about Martin Luther. And then uh, we had another uh, professor, named was Dr. Cruzy, and uh, Dr. Cruzy really, really, really wanted to be a pastor, but she was the wrong gender. And so again, so there was always, you know, even though I was a history major, a religion minor at Nebraska Wesleyan, there was this incredible tie between the church and history. And you're going to hear that a lot in this discussion here. And, um, and so I've titled this Southern Methodism in Butte, Montana. Uh, so a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, those of you that um, have seen my worship services at Aldersgate uh, or know much about me know that I like to do props. And so I've already worn those in the front row. I'm going to be handing some things out. And since this is a brown bag lunch, I put my props in the brown bag here. <laughs> so, uh, so the first one, and, and, and really this is important because uh, there's got to be some housekeeping. So one of the things that I'm going to be mentioning a lot about is... Um, M-E. I'm going to have to be saying M-E a lot, or Methodist Episcopal. Uh, so I need a volunteer that's willing to, to hold this sign up. Okay, all right. So when I prompt you, you hold that up and just, uh, that's your job. Thank you very much. Good <laughs> job. Tony? Yes. Okay, okay. I, I was trying to remember. Okay. What does it take? What's that? What does it pay? Uh, it pays my <laughs> gratitude and thanks. So thank you very much. So, so, and then the next prop that I have. Oh, no. It fell out in the car. Oh. oh. Yep. Well, you have to pretend. <laughs> That's all right. I actually have, so what I have is a squeeze head of John Wesley. And, uh, and so, uh, oh, wow, now I have to find it. I bet it's sitting in my car somewhere. Anyway, uh, so. He is my relative. He is your relative. Hey, good to know. All right. So uh, Wesley is considered to, for us, go ahead and hold this up. For us to understand M.E. and Methodist Episcopal, we need to look at John Wesley. So as you can tell by here, he spans seven, the 1700s in England. He is considered uh, the founder of Methodism. Now what is really important is that his, he never wanted to found a church. That was not his job. He was a priest in the Church of England. And um, I, I want you to think of Methodism really from John Wesley's perspective is like a reform movement, a, a, a way, a method. Actually, that's where the name Methodists come from, a method. So probably one of the best examples. So since I'm going to use you for props, I'm going to come over here. And um, so I know that Barbara goes is Methodist. Um, tell me what church you go to. All the day? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Method. Okay. What church do you go to? The Catholic church. Catholic church. And what church do you go to? I'm a secular human. You, okay. You, you don't go to church? That's all right? I don't at all. Don't believe it. That's all right. Okay. And um, I need someone that's not Catholic, not that doesn't go to church. Some uh, rep, another church here represented. So just first Christian. First Christian. Thank you very much. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So, so what Wesley would do with these Methodist classes or Methodist societies is they would get people together from all walks of life, whether they would be from Aldersgate, a Catholic church, um, maybe they were just very interested in religion, uh, maybe they went to a Christian church. They got together and they would, they would discuss things in what was referred to as these Methodist classes and you, you, you reformed yourself and then you went back to your own church to reform it. So that was what was so important about Wesley. So that was what was taking place in England during the 1700s. So we're going to cross the pond. 
as they say in England, to the colonies. So as you might imagine, in the early 1700s, there were Methodist church, met, these Methodist classes and Methodist societies everywhere, all over the place. Now, it wasn't a church. It was not a church. But just these, these groups of, of, of gatherers that got together, and they really, really liked what Wesley talked about, what he did, um, his emphasis on, on a certain method or a certain way of reforming themselves. And also one of the things that they found in the early 1700s in these colonies is the, the Church of England, or what was then known as the Episcopal Church here, um, was not very prevalent. They, they, it would have had a really hard time kind of keeping up with the growth in the colonies. And so it was very, very popular. So we're going to fast forward to the Revolutionary War. So by the time the Revolutionary War ends, there's these Methodist groups everywhere. And the Church of England is few and far between. And at the end of the war, there's a crisis. And the crisis really is that um, England never had a colony that successfully rebelled against itself. And so they didn't quite know what to do, not only from an England standpoint, but also from an American standpoint. And so these groups of Methodists in the brand new United Methodist Church, what they did is they went back to John Wesley. They were writing to him and they were saying, we need help. We don't want to be part of the Church of England. Um, they were kind of loyal to the king. They were kind of loyal to England. Uh, we don't feel really Episcopalian. Um, we really like this, this Methodist system. Now, as I said, John Wesley was a priest in the Church of England. And he didn't quite know what to do, but he did consider himself to be the parent or the father of Methodism. And so what he did, and there's two things to note here, is that he felt as the leader to ordain two individuals in 1784 um, to start a church. So the Methodism in the United States really started as a result of the Revolutionary War. A, a crisis individual, crisis point. And you're going to hear that come up, this theme of crisis, quite a bit. So that leads us to the first part. The second part, would you go hold, it and, and hold up that sign? Okay, Methodist Episcopal. What, what does that mean? Well, that one's pretty easy. Our history is Methodist and Episcopalian. We came out of the Church of England, me, we meaning the Methodism, came out of that, and actually, up until 1939, that was our denomination's name. And I could always tell you when a church was built if it, if it had Emmy in the name. So there we go. Recognize this building? Oh, yeah. What does it say? Mountain View Methodist Episcopal Church. Built before 1939. Because after 39, the name changed, and, uh, and we became the Methodist Church. But again, if you ever come across anything like this, and of course, you know, up here, uh, the current owner, he has taken out uh, Methodist up here, but it's pretty, pretty hard to chisel that out of that brick there. Yeah. <laughs> and you also see that in other places, though, in the National Historic Registry, you, you, of the other buildings, they will say M.E., uh, I think Trinity even. At some point, up has, says ME up there. I think it says Trinity ME. So, so you, again, churches that were built before 1939 has that in the denomination. Uh, there's actually another church that I want to talk about uh, really briefly. It also has ME in the name, Schaefer's Chapel. This is at the corner of Platinum in Idaho. And this actually stands for African Methodist Episcopal. So the black, the, a, there was a black denomination that broke off from the Methodist Episcopals very early on over the issue of racism and slavery. And um, up until the 1960s, we had in uh, Butte a church of the African Methodist Episcopal denomination. I would love to come back for another brown bay and talk about because their history is fascinating. So, but that's not part of our germane in our discussion. So, before I move on, any questions? Okay, I, thank you very much. All right. Okay, next one. So what we're going to do is we're going to be talking about the Methodist Episcopal Church South. Now, um, by 1840, Methodism was one of the largest denominations in our country, in both the South and in the North. As you might imagine, slavery was a hot-button issue, not only politically, but also in the church. 
So what do you do with hot button issues in the church? You ignore them, exactly, you avoid it. Because it's too controversial. That was until 1840. And by 1840, you had a bishop in Georgia by the name of James Osgood Andrew, um, who got married to a widow, and she owned slaves, and so, because she can't own the property, he owns them, and so he inherits these slaves. Now, there is a provision in the Methodist Episcopal Church that bishops, especially, but also pastors, could not own slaves. But he inherits these slaves, and there's a law in Georgia that says that um, you cannot free a slave. So, state law says you can't free a slave. The law of the church says you need to free him. You cannot be a bishop. So what's going to win out? So, another crisis in the denomination. And so by 1840, the church agrees that four years later, they're going to split into two denominations. That's my next. Okay, so, so... I need you to hold, this is blue, and this, this is kind of a gray, so we'll, we'll have you hold these two signs. So we've got, so in 18, 1844, they split into two non, non, denominations. Now go ahead and hold that up. So when you see uh, ME and you see ME South, okay, thank you, um, there's a sense that it should be split geographically. All right, so everyone that lives in the South belongs to which denomination? Okay, uh, ME South, and everyone, that's north of the Mason-Dixon long belongs to the original M.E. Church. The problem is that didn't happen. Almost as soon as 1844, when there was a split, the folks in the north went south and started started creating churches. And in fact, to this day, you will go to places in Texas, in Oklahoma, um, in Georgia, and I, I can verify this because I went to seminary with many of these classmates. They said that there are usually two United Methodist churches, usually blocks apart, and it doesn't make sense until you start examining their history. And they find that one was a part of the South, and one was started by some Northern missionaries. All right, so, the, so we know for a fact that the North is going to the South, starting these churches right next to Southern churches. And so I begin to think, hmm, if this is happening, people going from the North to the South, don't you think maybe it's going in the opposite direction? So I'm going to give you an example from my home state in Nebraska. I was telling Mr. Tyler, I had the opportunity of interning at the Nebraska United Methodist Archives. Now, um, I know since I was, grew up in Nebraska, I'm steeped in Nebraska history, it was one of the first states that joined the Union after the Civil War. It's always been a free state. The capital of, of Nebraska is Lincoln, named after Abraham Lincoln. I mean, there, it, it is, you can't get more after Civil War than Nebraska. So I always kind of wondered, why was there an ME South presence in Nebraska? And, and so I went and looked into it. And you see right over here, Missouri, Missouri border state. And so you had these missionaries from the ME South church that would come up and they would start these churches up in Nebraska. And so it began to make, it began to make me think, this is not about slavery. Because the slavery issue is already over. Um, there's got to be something else going on. And, um, and so I think it's now time for us to move to Montana. I want us to look at this map here. And uh, this is a map of the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And it doesn't have a year on it, but uh, by now um, we know that the church is growing into places really beyond the what you would think of as the Confederacy. So you, obviously you've got to see these churches here, but you've got a lot of border states where you have annual conferences. Up in Illinois, Missouri, there's three annual conferences. Up here you have what is called the Western Annual Conference in Nebraska and Kansas. There's Colorado. Montana! Montana has an annual conference of Methodist Episcopal Church South. The whole idea, if you have a conference, if you think about it, each conference means that there's quite a few you know, Methodists, Methodist Episcopal Church South. So in this area, this is a fascinating map and kind of looking at, okay, the spread of the ME South into these areas. Again, post-Civil War, and yet there is this growth. Now, um, 
I do have to make a, a pause here in the discussion. In 1939, the North, go ahead. Well, the, the, the North and the South, and actually one more a denomination called the Methodist Protestant Church, they all come together in 1939, and they create the Methodist Church. So, 1844 to 1939, I mean, that's almost 100 years, and also a lot of years after the Civil War. So, it really comes down to is maybe the, uh, the division and the separation and the crisis was slavery, but there's something else going on here. So, um, so it kind of led me to this next question when I moved to Butte here a couple years ago, is I, I kind of understand um, in Nebraska, because Nebraska is right connected to Missouri, you had uh, missionaries from the ME South Church in Missouri that are coming up to Nebraska. But I don't see Montana, I don't see any border states, I don't see any connection to the Confederacy. As Tyler said, we're just a hop, skip, and a jump from Canada. What's going on here? This is where I put you on the spot. What would be your theory as to why? Confederate soldiers. Confederate soldiers? Yeah. Confederate soldiers. Mm -hmm. Helena, had a, Helena has a lot of buildings in it that have Confederate uh, ties. Confederates? Confederate ties? Yeah. <coughs> Native Americans. Native Americans? Yeah. So that's my question. So yeah, when I came here, why would there be an ME Church South presence in Montana? And that, and we'll, we'll actually get to those theories. Um, so the theory that I was working with, now, I'm not a big Yellowstone fan. I did see 1923 because it was kind of fun seeing all the Butte stuff. But I love this show. Remember what happens in Lonesome Dove? Yeah. I mean, you got these cattle ranchers down in, in Texas, and they spend a little bit of time in Ogallala, Nebraska, and then they end up in Montana. And that is what I was thinking, is that, okay, you've got all these people that are coming up from the south. They're coming up to Montana like they do in Lonesome Dove. And then certainly uh, Taylor Sheridan kind of continues that with, with, uh, with Yellowstone. You've got these southerners in Montana. So I, that was the theory. I was moving along with that. So I decided to call the archivist at SMU. SMU stands for Southern Methodist University. It's not just a football school that received the death penalty. It was once the National Methodist Church for the ME South Church, SMU. And I thought of all places, where would they have information about the, well, go ahead and hold it up, you're going to hold it, the ME Church South, it would be the archivist at SMU. Okay, thank you very much. And, and so I, I called her up and I said, you know, we, we have this presence in Montana, um, can you tell me, do you have any records there? And the archivist said to me, you know, I always wondered that as well. Um, if you find out anything, give me a call. <laughs> she had nothing, nothing, and I thought, oh, all places, the National Southern Methodist University uh, would be at SMU. So um, that was kind of a, uh, uh, a dry end there, a dead end. Um, but I did know that there were other Methodist Episcopal Church South churches in Montana. So I began to inquire with other United Methodist pastors in Montana. Somebody's got to know. There's got to be some information. And that led me to Kelly Murdoch Billy. And I know that Kelly is, is watching us. Uh, she is a pastor in eastern Montana. And she led me to this fascinating book. And um, it is called The Life of Reverend L.B. Statler. And I love this tagline. A story of life on the old frontier containing incidents, anecdotes, and, and sketches of Methodist history in the West and Northwest. So... It, and it was written um, by this guy, E.J. Stanley, and uh, on the next page he says that he wrote it in 1907 when he was living in Whitehall. Oh. So, uh, you know, in the early 1800s, early 1900s, I don't know if, you, if you've looked at these books, they all continue, they all have these huge subtitles. Yeah. And, and so this book has The Life of Reverend L.B. Statler. And so there is a, uh, uh, and and I knew, I know that this book 
it, there's a copy of it at the archives in Helena. But do you remember what happened last year at the archives? They had a remodel. Yeah. And they weren't giving anything out. Yikes. But I did find that the University of Kentucky digitized the whole book. So can everyone say, go Wildcats! <laughs> I was amazing! I read this book twice! right on their website, it's all digitized. And so in fact, the copies that, I, that you're gonna see here come directly from the digital copies that they have online. So, oh, it was amazing. So uh, the first thing I wanna share with you comes out of the preface, and let me read this to you. Um, so, uh, so if you go back, so as I said, Stanley is this pastor, um, he's, re he's living in Whitehall, and he's interviewing Statler. And, um, and so he, I'll read this line up here. Uh, the story fired the heart of the young preacher. That's Stanley. Um, and not a word was lost of the inspiring and pulse-quickening narrative. It was to him as the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The old prophet, referring to Statler, found a historian and his junior preacher, and a ministry extended from Kentucky through Missouri, Kansas, and Colorado to Montana was to find a place in the annals of Methodism by the industrious tin of the enthusiastic listener and scribe. Kentucky to Missouri to Kansas to Colorado to Montana. That's going to be an important part of the story. So I will go ahead and I'll take these props away. Okay. And I've got two more. Okay. And so we're going to be throwing out some dates here. So this to you. So 1844 and 1861. All right. So as I said, we're going to have to be throwing out a bunch of dates. And so it's going to be really important. So go ahead and uh, hold up 1844. So as we talked about, this is when the denomination splits. And then 1861, what happens in 1861? All right, so when I ask you to hold those up at that point, so you can keep it down at this point. So, so um, Statler's story starts in 1831. He's from Kentucky, um, and he feels called to preach. And at that point, Kentucky contains, this, contains the area of Missouri, brand new state. And so by 1835, he is ordained, and... Um, um, so since Kentucky and Missouri are one annual conference, um, he's preaching, he's sent, his first appointment is sent to Missouri. And when he's in, in Missouri, he really likes it there. And so by 1835, Missouri is a state that's growing along with the annual conference there. It becomes its own annual conference. So he decides to stay in Missouri. And one of the things that the description that he has of the Missouri Annual Conference is that it extends all the way to the Pacific Ocean. So in 1837, now remember, go ahead and hold this up. This is, sti this is still all one M E church. This is before the split. So in 1837, he is sent to a church in Kansas. Thank you, Dwayne. Um, and he goes to work with the Delaware people in a place that is called Shawnee Mission. Does anybody know Kansas City geography very well? Uh, it is the largest suburb of Kansas City, Missouri, Shawnee Mission. And so where does the name Shawnee Mission come from? Well, he's working with the Kaw people, the Delaware people, the Shawnee people as a mission. So he's there, because, as I said, because the annual conference stretches from Missouri all the way to the Pacific Ocean. He's working specifically with the Native American population there. And while he is there at Shawnee Mission, some missionaries from Oregon show up. And they have the, he's got this great quote in his book. Who will respond to this call to carry the white man's book of heaven beyond the Rocky Mountains? Now, I don't know. He doesn't really say it, but I'm beginning to think at this point, he's thinking about Montana. So he, anyway, so there's this idea that, you know, there's, there is work that is going to be done. And... Um, and so, again, I'll hold that up. Again, this is all before the split. So um, we're going to fast forward to 1844. As I said, this is when massive reorganization happens. And there's this massive uh, uh, 
not only a split, but also a reorganization. And so by then, he has already been serving for about seven years with the Ka people, the Delaware people, the Shawnee people, Shawnee people there at Shawnee Mission. And, and so he becomes part of what is called the Indian Mission Conference. And he's got this quote in his book. The Indian Mission Conference adhered to the South in the division of the church. And I begin to think, I mean, that's where he is. He just happens to be working with uh, the Delaware people right there. And after, the, after 1844, when they split, the Indian Mission Conference becomes part of the South. How did he get to the South? Well, at that point, it, he's, he's right there. So, um, so I'm going to fast forward to 1854. Because in 1854, there is more changes. And by now, the Indian, oh, oh, there's one more thing that I need to mention about the Indian Mission Conference. So it includes all Native American ministries from Kansas, oh, from, excuse me, from um, Missouri all the way to the Rocky Mountains. So by 1854, um, the Indian Mission Conference changes its name. And, and the boundaries kind of change a little bit. And it becomes known as the Kansas Conference, but it includes this really mysterious district called uh, Pikes Peak. And so, uh, and, okay, so, um, and so Pikes Peak, so you see where this is kind of going. So, so you have an annual conference that stretches from the Mississippi River all the way to the Rocky Mountains. And so what Statler is doing is that he is starting to serve these Native American churches in Missouri and in Kansas. And at this point, he actually addresses the split. And so he, uh, um, in his book, he, he talks about the, the bishop in Georgia that owned slaves. And he talks about the various things that's going on. But then he says this. Um, let me find. And the, oh, right here he talks about the plan to split the, the, the denomination. And then he says, thus the climax, climax was reached. Under the circumstances, it was the only thing that could be done. It gave, both, gave relief to both sides. The church in the north, as Dr. Haas has so truly said, was freed from the odium of association with a slave-holding bishop. Okay? Um, though leaving it to bear until the Emancipation Proclamation came, the lesser burden of several thousand slaveholding members in its communion in the border conferences. It relieved the southern branch from the suspicion of being in alliance with New England agitators and emancipationists, <laughs> the chief obstacle to the work in evangelizing the Negroes, nearly 250,000 of whom were afterwards gathered into its communion, the largest body of converted heathen in all the world. So, so, what do you hear sometimes from people in the South about what do they refer to the Civil War as? The War, war of, of Northern, Northern Aggression. War of Northern Aggression. Yeah, that's, that's what I read here, is that it, it was great. It was a, it was a happy split <clears throat> because the, the North and the South hated each other. The North didn't have to worry about the Southern uh, bishop that owned slaves. And the South didn't have to worry about this alliance of New England agitators and emancipationists. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Okay, 1861, the Civil War. So at this point, Civil War happens. And, um, yeah, there's Pikes Peak. Civil War happens. And if you remember, Statler is a Southerner. And so um, the majority of the churches in Kansas, they don't want to be connected with the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And so they actually join with Nebraska at this time in the Civil War and create what is called the Kansas-Nebraska Conference. And they join with the North. And so um, it kind of leaves Statler um, out. He doesn't really have a place there in Kansas. And, uh, and so, um, so his conference of the ME South is huge. And so um, he gets appointed to Denver. And a really interesting story is, is um, so what takes place in, um, so annual conferences used to be held in September. And so he tells this story that um, as he's leaving from the area in Kansas 
to go to Denver, via, and he goes up to Fort Carnot, which is in Nebraska. They get caught into a snowstorm. And so it actually delays his trip. So by the time he gets to Denver, um, he has to replace this pastor. They haven't had a pastor for a while. And, and the pastor that comes in to kind of help things out is a guy by the name of the Reverend John Chivington who was best known as, you know, as the colonel who instigated the Sand Creek Massacre. And, um, and so, you know, this is, I think, a very correct historical thing to say, he's a jerk. He's a jerk and a half. Uh, I, I have a, a, a parishioner that goes to our, our church, and her husband actually was the, um, the, the superintendent of the site. She gave me some fascinating first hand, first and accounts of what took place, and it truly was a massacre. It was horrible. So anyway, so uh, as I said, um, Statler goes to Denver. Uh, the pastor leaves. Chivington, he's off fighting Indians. He's fighting in the Civil War. They haven't had a pastor for a while. And he gets to Denver, and the trustees sell the church. <laughs> I can't believe it. I cannot imagine if I would have came to view two years ago and the trustees sold this church. You know, it was like, and so there he is. He's in Denver. The church has been sold. Probably, I don't know if it has anything to do with Shimington or not, or with the previous pastor, but but he, he doesn't have a church, he doesn't have a salary, he's just kind of sitting around in Denver. He goes to this horrible snowstorm. It's just really, really bad. If it wasn't for a friend of his, and, the, and him, so this friend that I will show you, and his wife became best friends when they were in Missouri, because this guy was a Southerner. A guy by the name of A.G. Clark. He calls him, keeps calling him China Clark. Now, I went looking him up. I just found that he was a, a, a capitalist in Helena. And I found this, um, this mansion there in Helena, right on that address, as it being associated with A.G. Clark. So does anybody, can anybody tell me much about A.G. Clark? I, I found a few things online. Um, but anyway, they, they were friends. Their wives are friends, and so Clark kind of helps them out, and, and, and Clark eventually goes up to Helena, um, and, and I think for, you know, for a couple of years during the Civil War, it's what kept Statler going there in Denver. So uh, by, uh, and by 1864, he still doesn't have a church. Things are, he, he can only live on the, uh, uh, the good graces of A.G. Clark for so long, he decides to follow um, Bridger up to Montana. And so what we have is the first instance of, a met of him preaching in Montana on July 20th, 1864, in a place called Norwegian Gulch. He describes it as 35 miles northwest of Virginia City. Anybody know where that's at? Norwegian Gulch. Yeah, so it, uh, basically he finds this group of miners and he preaches to them. So that's his first instance. And then in the fall of 1864, and this is kind of special to me, he preaches there at Virginia City. I've been to that church building. Uh, we went, my wife and I went down to the, the Brewery Follies this summer, and as we kind of walked around, we saw this church, uh, Emmy Church, and here's this quote. They say to him, we have no minister and we want you to come preach for us. I thought that was kind of interesting because this is an ME North. This is an ME Church North. Um, that, and the building is still there, right on this National Historic Registry. And, um, and yet they're asking for a Southerner, an ME South pastor, to preach for them. So we're going to get to that question of why. Why do we have Southern Methodists in Montana? So uh, that same year, in 1864, he starts his first ME South church in a place called Willow Creek. Still there today. My friend of, my, friend of mine uh, preaches there. She pe preaches not only at, at uh, Three Forks, but also goes down to Willow Creek. So in 1867, he says that he has a home in the Jefferson Valley. And by then, he is a member of what is referred to as the Missouri Conference of the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And he is what is referred to as a presiding elder. Uh, basically, he is in charge of the Montana district as a presiding elder. Uh, sometimes it, it is called a district superintendent. And really, it comes down to it is that 
by the 1860s, you had all of these pastors that were coming up to Montana, but he was the only one that stayed. And usually that's what happens in history. You're just at the right place at the right time. And so he's there, he stays. And then uh, there's this great quote in the, uh, which answers the question of why. Mr. Statler was now left alone, presiding elder over himself, as there was not even a local preacher left in all the territory, it's referring to Montana, to assist him. And he was nearly 2,000 miles from the seat of his conference. He wrote to the church papers at home, setting forth the destitute condition of the country, and begged for men to be sent to occupy the needy fields. People were beginning to find out that it was a better country than they supposed. I think that would be a good tagline for Montana. It's a better country than we <laughs> suppose. Um, whoops, let me go back. Um, the soil was fertile. The climate was far less rigorous than was expected. The atmosphere was pure, exhilarating, and helpful. And the mining caps furnished an excellent market for everything that could be raised. And then he talks about the settlements extended rapidly and were, were without preachers. Many of the people had come from sections of the country where our church was strong. Missouri, Arkansas, Texas, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Virginia all, all well represented. While there was a goodly sprinkling of people from Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and the Carolinas. A large percent, however, was from Missouri. Hence, it was that there was such a call for our preachers. But years passed on and there was no response. In the printed, and then it talks about the printed minutes and the Missouri conferences. So when you talked about con Confederates, well, there's a little bit of that. You definitely had Confederates that were up here from, you know, he talks about all of these states, but it really came down to is that you had an open mission field. You had a state that was growing quickly and rapidly because of its mining history, and they needed preachers. It didn't matter if they were members of the ME North or the ME South. It was just, they just needed anybody. And so he has this plea, and because Statler is here, writing to the people of Missouri, basically saying, come on up! Um, it's, the atmosphere was pure, exhilarating, and helpful. Helpful. So um, that, to me, answers the why. Why are there Methodist Episcopal Church South churches in Montana because they needed pastors. Um, by 1870, uh, there is another reorganization. The church is growing. It is then called the Western Conference, which includes Kansas, Nebraska, and the Rocky Mountains. And then we find in 1871 this interesting note in his book. Um, this is a listing of pastors and where they're appointed. And right there, G. O. Hilton at Silverbell. 1871, first mention of Butte. Here's the problem now, I begin to think, oh my gosh, this is two years before Hugh Duncan. Now, if, if any of you know the history of Methodism here in Butte, Hugh Duncan, we have a record of him preaching in the summer of 1873. In fact, last year, the church that I was at, we celebrated 150 years of Methodism based on that record of Hugh Duncan preaching in 1873. 150 years later, we had that celebration. What does this take? This takes us back two more years. But the problem is we have no record of this G.O. Hilton actually preaching to Silver Bowl. In fact, we have a record of a lot of these people that were appointed, and they never showed up. And they had an annual conference, they were appointed to these areas, and um, either the conditions were bad, or family issues. Sometimes there's even stories in the book of just conditions. You know, we didn't have the interstate system. There's no highways. This is, this is the 1800s. They just didn't make it. And so, um, now, Tyler, if you come up with a record of Geo Hilton serving in Silver Bowl, let us know and we will adjust our records on that. But I think it's significant. Um, and uh, I don't know much about it until uh, Dick kind of did the presentation about the geography and history. I, I didn't even realize it was a separate town of Silver Bowl until he did, he did that presentation here. So, uh, so but anyway, if, if that is the case, that would be the first instance, even two years before Hugh Duncan, which founded Mountain View, the main Methodist church in this area. So that's very significant. Um, any questions?
Um, one thing I, I do want to mention, uh, a couple things that if you go to our church's website, at this point, um, this information comes from our website. So Stanley, who was the pastor in Whitehall, that, that he wrote this book, in 1878, he is, he is the first pastor that we know for sure served Butte. And so he is here in 1878. Um, it's also the first creation of what is referred to as the Montana Conference here of the Methodist Episcopal Church South. And then um, we know that the bishop uh, of the conference showed up here. And then we also know that over a 13 year period, annual conference was held here in Butte. Um, let's see, uh, several times. Which meant that Butte was a significant church that was growing. And we do know, uh, we have a record that in 1884, the church had 20 members and was held uh, at the Miners Union Hall before this church, this building was built. And I love this building. Uh, this is in our records at the church. Uh, Wilma put it up, Wilma Pewich. And what a gorgeous building. What an absolutely gorgeous building. When we were standing there uh, at that location of, for our historic tours, you're only just blocks from Mountain View. So you think about this, and this, so think about it at this point, again, this is, um, this is before 1939, this is before the denominations came together. It was a separate denomination. It doesn't have a connection with slavery, it just is a the Methodist Episcopal Church in the South. Uh, here's a description of it, noted architect William White designed this majestic multi-gabled church of stone and brick built at a cost of $16,000. Gothic lancet windows, stained glass, Romanesque arches, and wood tracery in the gable windows showcase White's meticulous attention to fine detail. A steeple above the entry and primordial roof once crowned the two corner towers visible in this 1905 sketch. And um, so yeah, uh, it's too bad that the church doesn't look like that now. I have a later picture of what it looks like now. Um, this, this information, <clears throat> came from Dick Gibson at a hospital. I, I love this. So uh, Reverend Settle, he had came up from Missouri, saw the need for a hospital, and so in uh, June 29, 1899, he remodeled this building, and uh, the institution was called St. Paul's Hospital. The short-lived hospital stood at the southeast corner of Gold and Montana. Southeast corner of Gold and Montana. It was only listed in the city directories from 1900 to 1902. And, um, and then the quote here from 1901, the sum of $500 has recently been spent in the operating room alone. For a dollar a month, one can have medical treatment, board, nursing, and surgical attendance, and furthermore, the choice of 30 doctors. So, <clears throat> um, and then, uh, so why did it close up? Well, Sisters Hospital, which became St. James, was already in operation, much larger, and basically forced it out of business. <clears throat> so I, historians like to speculate. Oh, that's my phone. <laughs> um, historians like to speculate. And my speculation, and the books that we're gonna be handing into the archives here today, that Joanne has right there, um, talks about some very, very bleak times, both financially and with members. My speculation is Reverend Settle did not leave the church in a good financial shape. Because what takes place next, and this is what the church looks like now, is um, it was sold to a mortician, later Silver Bowl Sheriff Larry Dugan, a sympathizer with the incident, the IWW, and the building housed the Butte Daily Bulletin, a radical newspaper voicing policies of the anti-Anaconda Nonpartisan League published by William F. Dunn. And um, on September 13, 1918, local police and federal troops under Major Omar Bradley raided the bulletin, arresting 24 men and throttling a minor strike. As you know, the military is not allowed <clears throat> to participate in police action, and yet we have a story here in 1918 when they did. Yeah. That is fascinating about the history of that building. So, um, now, <clears throat> by the, here's where the history gets a little murky. 
Um, we know that in 1907, so we don't quite know when this building was sold to Dugan, but we know it was by 1918. So we do know that there was a second, there were two Methodist Episcopal Church South churches in the community. And so by 1907, there's a mention of a church. It was it, All it is is in the records. It's called 4th Avenue Southside. That's all, it, that's all the record is. And by 1920, the congregation moves to its current location on Lowell Avenue, and it, it is named Bellevue. Well, if you look at the original records, the area where the Rock Church is now is known as, was originally known as the Bellevue neighborhood. So uh, by 1924, they have called themselves Lowell Avenue. And um, so one of the things that we found when we uh, had our 150th, um, so one of the things that we did is we decided to go around, we took field trips. And I see several people that went on those field trips. And one of them was to St. Paul's, which is just down the street here. And the other one was to the Rock Church. And so we had some questions. And I'll tell you what, the field trip was great because it really put things into perspective. We have some gaps in its history. So one of the gaps was that, let me, oh, let me go back, was that this church closed up and turned into this. But that's not true. We've actually found records that they were open at the same time. Uh, but we do know, as I said, that this church closed. And from what we found out with some members that are in their 90s that told us that when this church closed, they joined this church because it was the other M.E. South church. And here it was, it was a church that was on the flats in the area. And, and we also know that in 1954, the name changed to St. Paul's. And again, I think that's why there was that confusion there that one church closed up, moved location, and became St. Paul's. No, we were told that the reason it became uh, St. Paul's, and this is to the attribute of George Parrott, is that they wanted to be sounding like all the other churches. Lowell Avenue doesn't sound like a church name, but St. Paul's does. And so that's what George told me. He was a teenager there and tells this great story. Uh, what, what, what I don't have is an interior, but right in there when you walk in, you immediately go up the stairs. And um, I have George's permission to tell this. As a teenager, he jumped off the stairs and hit his head on the ceiling there. And not, and he said he knocked himself out for several hours. I don't believe that, but, uh, but if you know George Perry, you know, that was his, his story. And uh, as one of the, one of the um, members that went there on the field trip and, and attended there. So um, that's all I've got about Southern Methodism. And, and eventually, uh, this church closed became Alder and, and was one of the many churches in this community that helped form Aldersgate United Methodist Church in the late 50s. Seth, when did the, the first Lowell Avenue Church close? Yeah. Uh, well, this one... Um, I mean, when did it... No longer a Methodist church. Um, it, about, uh, I think it was in the early 50s, about 54, 56. Uh, basically, they closed their doors and, and then went right into Aldersgate. Oh, okay. Yeah. And um, it was my understanding that Saint sat vacant for a little bit and then was sold to a Pentecostal church. And uh, the, the pastor, JC, who was the pastor of the Rock Church, allowed us to. Um, visit the inside and, and and of course you know George and, and a few of the others that attended Lowell Avenue when, when they were kids had a great time looking at uh, the building and the Sunday school rooms uh, but yeah this is what it looked like originally and then what it looks like now so other questions yes 